Hello everyone and welcome to PC Retro Tech. In this week's video I'm going to be taking a look at this machine here which is an IBM Model 30. Well it's that time of year again and I managed to save up a little bit to buy something and in fact managed to get two computers. Uh, this one I got very cheap. You can see that it's damaged badly here. Uh, but when I opened it up I found that the story is much more complicated than I thought. Now I think the IBM Model 30 is a really significant machine, uh, but I can totally understand why more fuss is not made about it, and I'm going to explain why that is in this video. But first of all, let's take a look at this machine and see what we find when we open it up. Well in order to get into this thing there are two screws on each side here, and they're actually spring loaded. Uh, although the springs are actually missing on a couple of the screws on this particular case. Uh, but we just unscrew these and then we should be able to pop the top off the machine. Well you can see there's quite a bit of damage around the case here. There's cracks and the plastic all over the place and the ones at the front that I mentioned. Uh, a little bit more about that later. Uh, but the top just slides off like this. Well this is the inside of the machine and uh, by the way these switches come in red and white and I actually looked around for a red one because for reasons that I can't explain uh, the red ones just look so much more iconic to me. Now the main board is an all-in-one proprietary board as you might imagine and uh, you can see that we've really dodged a bullet here. Uh, this lithium battery is actually not leaked uh, which is amazing. I bet it doesn't work but at least it's not a cleanup job. It's definitely something you have to look out for in these. Uh, now the CPU is down here, it's an 8086 processor, uh, in fact it's an 8086-2 at 8 MHz and uh, this is a really zippy machine as you'll see a bit later. And the coprocessor is, uh, would go in this slot here, it's actually not populated at the moment, that would be your 8087. Now the other thing that's uh, really weird about this machine uh, is the connectors for the hard drive and floppy drive. They have these sort of proprietary connectors uh, which uh, don't have Molex connectors for power. The power is actually delivered via these. And uh, this is really a problem because it means that these are not standard drives. And if anything goes wrong with either of these, uh, the only way you're really going to be able to fix that is to buy a whole new system. And uh, so that's going to be very expensive uh, if you're a collector of these sorts of things. So definitely something to watch out for in this. Now I switched to a side view here uh, so you can see the memory and there's not very much of it and uh, I believe that it's also not possible to upgrade it very far. Now there's a little speaker here and you can also see the ISA slots here. Uh, now I know there's some people saying immediately, wait a minute, this is an IBM PS2 machine and uh, those had microchannel architecture but it turns out that the 8086 model actually had ordinary ISA slots and you have to be really careful with these IBM PS2s. Uh, some of them had 286s in them, some of them have the microchannel architecture. And so you really want to know what you're buying before you go ahead and purchase because otherwise you could end up with something that's, you know, got proprietary MCA and is not very upgradable at all. Well, I haven't been able to determine which chips are actually responsible for the video output. Uh, there's a few large chips around the place which look like candidates, uh, but unfortunately some of these just have all the same part numbers on them and I can't identify them from the part numbers. Uh, but my guess would be that maybe this chip is responsible for hard and floppy drive, controller and ISA slots. Uh, the chips in here are responsible for video since they're quite near to the video output which is at the back corner here. And uh, maybe these are the BIOS chips uh, for the machine. But this is really pure guesswork. What I can tell you is that this machine has a really interesting video uh, adapter and we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, it's called MCGA and it's a kind of proto VGA that IBM were working on and it's one of the things that makes this machine so interesting and unique. Well I did manage to find out some more. Uh, those two chips that I thought were ROMs are indeed exactly that. And the chip at the back uh, with the gold top on it near the video output, uh, well you can see for yourself that's a high performance CMOS color lookup table, whatever that is. And it says it's designed to be compatible with IBM PS2 VGA graphics systems. 
And if you look at the block diagram here, you see that it has basically 256 uh, registers uh, that are 18 bits wide. And this is exactly what you find in VGA for mode 19. Uh, there are the 256 colors that you can set uh, that will show on the screen. Uh, there's also three 6-bit DACs and uh, there's a latch here and so on. Uh, but uh, that mode 19, uh, which you would have seen in the previous video that I made when I actually looked into programming the VGA, uh, is actually sometimes referred to as the MCGA mode. And uh, so that was actually retained for compatibility with this uh, particular machine. Uh, anyway, let's get to turning this machine on and see whether it works at all. Well, there's nothing for it other than to switch this on and show you what happens. Uh, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to count the memory, and I expect that to be 640 kilobytes in this machine. And indeed, it will count up to 640, and everything seems to be fine uh, on that score. Uh, the real problem is this, uh, it says diskette drive error, and this is actually the floppy drive, uh, which is not functioning. Now at this point there's really nothing else you can do, you can't replace the drive, uh, so the machine is essentially worthless. Uh, now I have looked online, there are some people that suggest that similar models, not this particular one, uh, have problems with capacitors. I don't see any that look obviously bad in this machine. And they're kind of miniature electrolytics as well, which would be hard to match. Uh, so in a moment of impulse buying, uh, which I'm probably going to regret for a long time, I went ahead and purchased another IBM Model 30. Now, as you can see, this one is also not in brilliant condition. It's missing a couple of the face plates. Uh, but it doesn't have the damage to the surround at the front and I could take the face plates off the other machine and put them onto this machine. I'll do that a little bit later and then we'll have a complete machine. Uh, but the reason that I paid for this one and I paid considerably more I have to admit uh, is that the person who was selling it showed that the drives were working and I think that's really what you have to do with these Model 30s. Uh, buy one that you know is functioning. Well let's see if this machine fares any better. I'll switch it on and I expect this machine to also have uh, 640 kilobytes of memory. Uh, that's a completely standard configuration for these machines. Uh, so no surprises there. Uh, and again, uh, that'll all go through and the difference is that the floppy drive seeks in this machine. Now in case you're wondering, it's not the battery. Um, I've actually switched the drives over to check and that floppy drive is definitely dead. Uh, this one is working. Uh, as you can see, it's going to boot uh, just fine to DOS here. And what's even more amazing, uh, to me at least anyway, uh, is that the hard drive actually works. Now it's completely blank, uh, but this seems to be a 20 meg drive uh, that's actually functioning. So that's a good story. That means that we can actually use this machine and try it out and see what it's capable of. Uh, before I do that though, I want to actually check the drives in this machine and see how the hard drives are doing. So I'm going to run a scan disk and I'll start with this machine, uh, the second machine that I purchased and see how that's looking. Well this is the hard drive from the second machine and uh, as you can see uh, it has a lot of bad sectors on it. All those F's are basically bad sectors. It's not finding uh, any more uh, in addition to the ones that were already found when I formatted it but uh, you can see that the drive is pretty badly damaged right across almost all of the surface. Now it doesn't actually add up to that much in terms of kilobytes uh, over the drive, um, so it's still a usable drive, uh, but obviously it's failing pretty quickly and uh, I don't think these IBM drives are really all that reliable. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the drive out that I just tested and swap it over for the one in the original machine that I bought and see whether it works any better. Of course I need it in the machine that I have a working floppy because I need to run ScanDisk. Now to get these out, uh, you just lift the tab and it slides forward. Uh, you can then take the cable off and the drive will slide out. 
Uh, so that's what it looks like and I think you can agree that this is uh, quite a bit different to uh, the normal hard drive. Uh, so you can see that proprietary connector is actually built into the main board of the drive there. Uh, so I'm definitely not going to be able to get another one of those. This is the drive from the original machine that I bought and as you can see there are fewer bad sectors but it's still a pretty bad story here. Uh, fortunately most of them seem to be toward the end of the drive and I could actually partition those out and uh, maybe just use the rest of the drive but what I'm going to do is just use this drive until it finally gives up uh, then I can swap over to the other one until that gives out uh, and then I'll just have to look for another machine. Well while we're at it what I can do is move these faceplates over to this machine here uh, the seller for this machine actually supplied me with the uh, user manual and it's in German but inside is a little baggie uh, with all the little bits of plastic that he found uh, when the machine broke. Unfortunately the one that's from here, the little triangular piece at the top is missing uh, so there's no real chance of restoring this to perfection and uh, this part is actually uh, fixed into the surround. It's not separable and so I can't move that to here unfortunately. Uh, that's a shame because this is in better condition than that one is. Uh, but these other face plates are pretty easy to take out. Uh, I'm just using a little piece of plastic here uh, to lever them and they just slide forward and then I can uh, clip them into place here uh, if I'm careful to put them in the right place and uh, so that'll mean that we'll end up with a machine that doesn't look too bad. It's not perfect, but uh, it's better than uh, when it arrived. So I'm kind of glad that I have the two machines now and that I can make one good one out of the two bad ones. Uh, so this is now our system and I'm going to go ahead and install some software on it and we can check out what it can actually do. Well, I thought I'd show you inside this machine. Uh, there's a few very small differences. There's a little bodge wire uh, that goes to this chip here and another larger one that goes all the way to the back of the machine. Now, I don't know what those are about, but it's actually possible that someone's repaired some leakage from a battery at some point. Uh, but they've done an excellent job if that's the case because I can't really tell uh, if it is. Uh, the other big surprise is that the coprocessor socket in this one is populated. There's actually an 8087 in it. And uh, the rear of this machine is actually slightly different as well. It's not plastic but metal. Uh, but other than that, uh, this particular machine is almost identical to the other one. Well, I probably should have mentioned that this machine was produced way back in early 1987, the same year that the original IBM VGA adapter came out. And so we should expect some of the early VGA games to work. Now, the ones that require VGA modes that came later are certainly not going to function. Uh, but those that require the mode 19, the MCGA mode, uh, should work just fine. And there's quite a lot of those. Uh, so Moby Games to the rescue. Uh, if you type MCGA into the search bar and then click on year here, uh, you get a list of all the games that support the MCGA modes uh, but which are produced in a given year and you can go through from 1986 all the way through to the modern day. Now uh, the thing that we have to worry about here is that we only have an 8086 processor which is pretty slow uh, compared to other machines that had VGA adapters later on. And so we can pretty much rule out anything from about 1992 onwards as being unlikely to work uh, because it'll be too slow. Uh, but we might be able to get some of these earlier games to work. Now I shouldn't have too much trouble getting access to ones up to 1990. After that it becomes a little more difficult for me. But I'm going to pick a few out of this list uh, that look interesting and we're going to run them on this system and see how they perform. The first game I'm showing is A10 Tank Killer from 1989 and you can see those MCJ colours, the 256 colours in the cockpit there. Uh, the scenery itself is a little bit more bland because of course there's no texture mapping in this era. The CPU has to do everything and it can barely keep up with these flat shaded polygons. As you can see it's a fairly low frame rate. I actually had problems with this game when I started it. About the first dozen times I ran it, uh, the keyboard was just randomly firing. I couldn't control any of the menus and so on. 
And for some reason, this time around, it just seemed to work. Uh, nothing's really changed. Uh, so I don't know what the cause of that is. Uh, now, of course, uh, the graphics adapter in this is quite quick. And in fact, the CPU is not hamstrung in any way. Uh, the slow performance here is really just uh, down to the fact that this is a fairly demanding thing to do, a simulation like this uh, in real time uh, for a CPU like the 8086. So you kind of have that juxtaposition between you know, a slow CPU and a really fantastic graphics that's characteristic of this particular machine. Uh, so I'm going to show some other games from before 1990, uh, then I'm going to show some other interesting uh, benchmarks and comparisons in between, and then we'll show some games from 1990. The next game I want to show is Budokan, also from 1989. And uh, when it starts out, you're in a courtyard uh, that looks a lot like it's going to be an adventure game. Uh, you walk up into this little uh, building here, uh, but it's actually a fighting game. Uh, so I'll select Budokan, which is uh, the tournament, and it'll take you to the tournament location. And you can see that it's beautifully illustrated, uh, really, really colourful drawings all the way throughout this game. And the gameplay is no exception. So you get to select uh, a discipline. So I'm going to select Kendo against uh, this karate guy here. And uh, I'm not very good at this game. I've only actually beaten an opponent in this once. Uh, which might sound a bit crazy, but the controls are really not intuitive at all. Uh, so when you start out, you can sort of jump across by holding down two keys, and then uh, you can press uh, various buttons on the, um, the keypad at the same time as uh, you know, the right shift key. For example, I can squat down and do uh, moves from a squatting position. And uh, what I found quite difficult is that if you do too many hits, your stamina goes down. If you don't do enough, uh, then your opponent gets the jump on you and you lose. So it it's actually takes quite a bit of skill, uh, I imagine quite a bit of time to get any good at this. And as you can see, I'm about to lose. And that's a bit of a theme for me in this game. Uh, but anyway, really beautifully done. Um, Definitely a lot of fun, um, but it's challenging to play as well. But it doesn't require a lot of CPU power. Um, it's obviously well matched to this machine. Great graphics, uh, not so much CPU required. The third game I want to show here is called Revenge of Defender. And uh, you can see it's a scrolling shooter, but unfortunately uh, it doesn't scroll smoothly. And sometimes you can't even see uh, the fire from the ship uh, because uh, the screen's updating at the wrong time. Now, I don't know whether that's down to a limitation of the NCGA hardware uh, that was fixed in VGA, or whether it's actually due to the game expecting a much uh, later processor. Uh, but it does show that there were significant limitations for some games. Even though they would run and you could see what they'd be like, uh, you really couldn't play them on this system. Uh, so that's a little bit of a shame, um, but uh, you know, obviously technology moves on. Uh, so let's also move on to the fourth game uh, from before 1990. The fourth and final game I picked to show you is this one called Archipelagos. And the objective of this game is to wander around and uh, absorb the energy from all of these eggs that are lying about. And then once you have uh, sufficient energy, uh, to go back and uh, to destroy an obelisk. Now, uh, I like this game uh, because of the graphics. It has a nice gradient in the sky and the water and so on. And I also like it because it's just really unique. Uh, to move about, you just point to a location. Uh, so long as it's green, uh, you should be able to go there when you press space. Uh, you can actually scroll and pan uh, a little bit faster if you turn the crosshairs off as well. And uh, apparently there are thousands of islands in this game, and you can even make some yourself. Uh, you can see that it's uh, really well done. It's very, very highly optimized. Uh, it's amazing that something like this can run on the 8086. Uh, so that's my fourth and final choice uh, for games before 1990. Uh, before we get on to the after 1990 games, 
uh, or at least the ones that were made in 1990, uh, I want to show you a comparison of my uh, Model 30 with uh, my Amstrad PC1512, which some other people will have seen on the channel before. And I'm just going to run some uh, demos uh, to uh, show the difference in performance of the graphics system. Now, both of these machines have an 8086 at 8 megahertz. Now, what I want to show first here is a comparison of the Amstrad PC1512, which I've got running on the right, and the IBM Model 30, which I have running on the left. Now, this is an 80 by 25 text mode demo. It's a rotor zoom that I wrote uh, with the PC Retro Tech Gecko. And uh, it's using some uh, tricks of the CGA adapter, which I was really surprised to find work absolutely fine on the Model 30 with its MCGA adapter. Uh, so they really did a very faithful uh, CGA implementation here, it seems, at least as far as this effect is concerned. Uh, so this is uh, obviously going a lot faster on the Model 30 on the left. Uh, I think. Uh, it takes around six seconds to do a full rotation of the screen. It's the same code running here, but it's about nine uh, uh, seconds per rotation on the right uh, on the Amstrad PC 1512. The second thing I want to show is this effect, which we've seen on the channel before as well, the rotating icosahedron that I coded up. And what I've done here is make it larger, so it's chunkier looking, but because it's bigger, it's taxing the graphics subsystem much more. And you can really see the difference with the Amstrad PC1512 on the right being much slower than the Model 30 on the left. And this is really where the Model 30 is at for me. The MCGA graphics are nice and all, and of course if you've got games that don't have great CPU requirements, then it's fantastic. Uh, but to be able to do this sort of thing, uh, and really be able to experience the full benefit of the 8086 with its 16-bit data bus, uh, compared to, say, something like uh, an IBM PC with an 8088, uh, it really makes the difference. And, you know, if you've got a graphics adapter like in the 1512 that's holding you back, you don't see that uh, big step up as much. Uh, now, Amstrad did actually bring out a much better graphics subsystems. Uh, the, even the 1640 was better than this, but the PC2086 had a much better one. I think the Model 30 still beats it out a little bit, uh, but uh, they made big leaps and strides forward. Uh, so now let's get back to some games. Uh, I now want to look at some MCGA games from 1990. The final two games that I've chosen are for nostalgic reasons because I played them as a kid, over and over actually. And I also chose them because of the sound. Uh, so I've taken the cover off the PC here so that you can hear uh, the sound coming through the PC speaker which is not very loud. Uh, so I'll just shut up for a bit and you can hear it. That little tiny speaker in this machine isn't uh, very powerful, uh, but that's playing uh, almost like a soundtrack uh, just through the PC speaker, which is just a beeper, really. Uh, so this is a very clever trick um, that I was extremely impressed with back in 1990. Now, this game, Lynx, takes quite a long time to load. There's quite a lot of uh, loading screens. Uh, so I'm going to pause the video here and come back uh, when I've actually got into the golf game itself. Well, as you can see, the graphics, uh, at least these loading screens, are really quite good. Uh, this is a photograph, of course, uh, but it renders really nicely in this VGA mode. Uh, the game itself is very, very slow to load, and uh, it takes ages to draw anything at all. Um, it's actually really woefully underpowered and this is a problem that you have with uh, games as you go through the years they become more and more demanding uh, and so just having the graphics capability is not enough you really need the CPU to back that up and you can see here the rendering of the scenery is just atrociously slow uh, now of course uh, the other problem that eventually came for people was uh, the requirement to have a genuine VGA. Uh, and the MCGA was really only for the IBM Model 25 and 30, 
and I had a very, very short-lived uh, life. Uh, VJ was uh, introduced later that year, and of course, pretty soon after that, everyone was buying VGA cards. Uh, so that was a big hit for uh, IBM in the end. Uh, so I'm just going to let this load up. Uh, I think my version of this game may have actually become corrupted at some point. Uh, so I'm not sure if I will be able to actually show you the gameplay itself. Uh, but it's mainly the graphics I wanted to show anyway, and certainly that pumping soundtrack at the beginning, uh, which is really just so iconic for this particular game. Uh, so I think it's nearly loaded up now, and we'll see whether or not it lets me actually play. Uh, I think it actually has worked this time. Let me just have a look. Uh, so the idea is that you click on this swing thing here, and when you reach the top and the bottom, you click, uh, and then uh, it sort of bases its accuracy on how well you did that. Uh, you can also mulligan, which means that you uh, get to try the same swing again. Uh, cheat, in other words, something you can't really do in uh, real golf. And, uh, of course, I'm not very good at this. Uh, but that's uh, Lynx Golf. Uh, I think this is a fantastic game, and I really enjoyed playing this as a kid. Uh, but I'm going to now move on to another game which also has a fantastic soundtrack uh, in its startup. And that game is Thunderstrike. Now, this is a game that I played the music for over and over as a kid. Um, and it's a game that I lost for a long time, but a friend of mine, Jim Leonard, helped me track this down. Uh, so I'll just let you hear the sound as it plays. So it's a bit more muffled or distorted as you can hear on this machine and I don't know whether that's uh, just because it's uh, underpowered CPU or whether there's some other issue here but uh, I remember it being much clearer when I was a kid and uh, that's why I listen to it so often. Uh, now I had to think about uh, the graphics in uh, one of the earlier games where we saw the side scrolling was very very slow uh, on MCGA. And I realized that in this mode 19, uh, the memory layout is such that you only have one page, uh, one video page. And so if you want to be scrolling, uh, the only way I can think to do it in a naive way is just to redraw the entire screen uh, every frame. Uh, so there are no sort of hardware tricks to allow you to do smooth scrolling that I know of off the top of my head. Uh, so there are other modes in which you can do that. and. Uh, so this may be one of the reasons why the MCGA uh, isn't able to do that particularly well, or at least not in the, the game that we looked at. Uh, so I'm now going to just pause again uh, because it'll take a while to go into this game and then I'll show you the gameplay. Well this is what it looks like when it starts up finally and uh, there's a little bit of an intro uh, at the start here and then uh, if you press F2, it'll go into the game itself. Now, the controls in this game are a little bit difficult to uh, figure out just by guesswork. Uh, so I did manage to figure out that uh, if you press P, it'll move forwards, and Z and X steer left and right, and then spacebar fires. Uh, so it took me quite a while to figure that out, uh, but uh, the idea is that you fly around now, the thing that impresses me the most about this is just how smooth it is, uh, given what's going on. This is actually really an impressively written game. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly impressed by this. Uh, you can see the enormous amount of uh, polygons that are being drawn here, and the refresh rate is actually quite high. Um, and there's, you know, gameplay and sound on top of that. So. Uh, I certainly remember playing this a lot when I was a kid, but I think I played the soundtrack much more than I did uh, the actual game itself. Uh, I was just so impressed by that pipe organ music. I enjoyed pipe organ music as a kid anyway, uh, but this was uh, very special. Anyway, uh, this is uh, all more of the same, so I'm not going to keep playing this for ages, but I hope you've had uh, an enjoyable look at all of these uh, games and 
um, you know, this very, very unique PC uh, that had a really unique place in the history of the development of PCs uh, just before VGA was introduced. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that uh, this machine wasn't that popular at the time and I can certainly see why it's not that popular now, uh, especially with the possibility of having you know, incompatible uh, hard and floppy drives and uh, you know, the possibility that you might end up with MCA uh, and the really unmatched CPU and graphics capabilities of the machine. Uh, but I still think it's a, a unique and really interesting PC and certainly something that's very, very interesting to develop uh, code on and for. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, if you want to see more of this, uh, then don't forget to give a like and subscribe and we'll see you in a later video. Bye.